connect those two worlds. Power up in game when you're powering up the car. Sounds like a slogan. That, that, that's like a marketing yeah, tagline like in addition to, to a me. piece of advice. <laughs> I'm very happy to introduce two guests to the Beam podcast today. Christina Lutz, the executive VP of marketing for GSTV. She's going to tell us a little bit more about herself and the company uh, momentarily. And also our very own Lane Solberg, who is the SVP of business development here at Super League and was the architect of the partnership that was announced a little while ago uh, between Super League and GSTV, which were excited has started to uh, bring some opportunities to life for the company for very specific reasons that uh, we're going to share today. Before we dive in to um, more kind of informative um, business information, I always like to give our listeners a little bit of something that they um, get to know and learn about, uh, about our guests. Um, and uh, I think we're going to start with Christina. I don't know that people quite have a full picture of a little piece of your background that, you know, maybe in this hot new space of gambling and betting, but from a while back when it was at a bit of a different state. Yeah, nice tie in there, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, you know, first of all, whenever I get asked this question about like, tell us something about yourself other people don't know, I feel like I give away the few things I've got that help me usually win the game two truths and a lie. Um, so I'm giving one of those away right now, which is, you know, anyone we were just talking about this before, anyone who knows me well, knows I went to Iowa, go Hawkeyes, Caitlin Clark. Um, but what most people don't know is the summer after I graduated from Iowa, I was actually a blackjack dealer while I was trying to decide where I was going to move, what I was going to do, what company I, I was going to work for, and how that actually ties into the industry. And, you know, I guess where I am today is I owe my current career trajectory to that moment in time when I was a blackjack dealer, when someone, a student sitting across from me at the table said, this is a great job. How do I get this job? And I said, well, I'm moving to Chicago, I think, soon to work in advertising, so my job will be free. And she's like, oh, what are you going to do in Chicago? And I said, I want to work in advertising. She said, my dad's an executive vice president at Leo Burnett. And I said, I have an idea. Wow. And that led to an interview and and uh, getting my first job at Leo Burnett. So funny how those forks in the in the road lead us to where we are now. But that also further leads to where we are now because Lane and I started our early career together at Leo Burnett and that's how I know him. So here we are today, just a few years later. And and I think more important than anything, did that student end up getting your job as a blackjack dealer? I hope so. I don't, that is a real good <laughs> question. I don't know After for that sure. great hookup, you didn't make sure that she got the placement. I was... I was out, you know, I left yep. for Iowa City. But, um, you had other, other I did strongly recommend that she she get that job. I mean, there couldn't have been huge demand, but uh, it was fun. It was definitely fun for a summer. That's fantastic. And, and I'm now, a good black tech dealer as a result. I, I mean, it's actually a pretty, <laughs> you know, you, you, you might get a lot of grief as a blackjack dealer, but no more grief than you get in the ad sales business. This is um, true. This is very true. So Lane, your background is uh, obviously we just, you know, heard early on in the advertising business, but um, you sort of have, I think, uh, a profile that not everybody would would attribute to the lane that they know, and it's more <laughs> in your home. I think you're, you're some sort of OG gamer, and as far as your family's <laughs> concerned, is that is that right? Uh, yeah, I, I will. Uh, I've, I'm known to disappear into the man cave, and uh, I'll, I'll say it's going to be 15 minutes, and three hours later, Dad reemerges. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, I started playing, uh, video games and, and actually we did some early video games all the way back to Leo Burnett time. I didn't know Christina was a card counter, but it makes sense that now <laughs> that's why she's so good at media. You know, she's doing all the, the numbers in her head so fast. Um, but yeah, uh, my professional network would know me as, you know, a performance marketer, uh, focused on results with, you know, identity targeting and measurement and all that kind of good stuff on, being a good steward for how a brand is spending money and and at a dinner conversation with my kids in high school and college that gets about five seconds into the conversation and they're asleep in their spaghetti. Um, but when dad's racking up victory royales in uh, Fortnite or, you know, winning solo in Call of Duty, all of a sudden they want to hear about that. And um, 
you know, coming to work at Super League where we're bringing brand activations into those environments and doing concerts in games and things that they're actively wanting to spend their own time in. All of a sudden, they want to hear what dad does for a living. Like, oh, wow, that's cool. Uh, that That's and they're, they're a good uh, litmus test, like an in, internal focus group on uh, if this is resonating. And the nice part is I'm hearing that kind of come back from uh, peers that are in that kind of CMO uh, role now and they've got kids that are going through the same thing and when they say they, they're doing something cool in Minecraft or Roblox or or Call of Duty all of a sudden everybody leans in it's it's a, it's a fun place to uh, be doing things and experimenting and and we know that the next generation is spending a lot of their time there um, so it just makes sense it's nice to see work and and uh, passions coming together well I, I gotta say there's um, it's, it's probably understated how powerful it can be when you go home as a parent and something that you do professionally actually energizes a conversation with your kids, it may motivate you to do a little bit more of that. So we're very excited for more CMOs to talk about gaming at the dinner table and on vacation with the kids so that every day they come back from that, they want to put more energy, more dollars into the kinds of things that we're doing. So, um, Gaming is a portion of um, the sort of focus for, for G GSTV, but I think important um, to this conversation is to provide a, a background here, Christina. What, what is GSTV, Gas Station TV? How did it sort of come to life and, and what is the business? Yeah, sure. Um, I can't tell this story, shame on me, right, as the head of marketing, but uh um, GSTV has actually been around um, for quite some time, was previously called Gas Station TV, changed her name a little while ago. Um, but it's really, we really consider it a young company um, that was reinvented when our current CEO, Sean McCaffrey, um, came over about six years ago. Um, and, you know, so what are we? What is, what is GSTV? Well, we like to call ourselves the country's largest on-the-go video network. What does that mean? We're a digital platform, digital video platform, very specifically video, sight, sound, and motion um, that is delivered out of the home in the most um, attentive environment um, that um, has been measured per a Lumen study that just came out that we haven't announced yet. So a little, little precursor on some really interesting attention data about to come out. Um, but we provide entertaining, snackable, we like to think of it as like your social feed. Um, programming that is interspersed with ads by our brand partners um, in a short, uh, very consumable show. Um, we are distributed at 29,000 fuel and convenience retailers across the country. And that distribution um, allows us to um, provide huge scale, bigger than um, many um, TV partners um, at over 115 million uniques a month. Um, and not just a large number of viewers, but viewers, what do, we mean by, what do we mean by on the go? Viewers that are on their way to do something. Fuel day is errand day. And our viewers, our consumers spend on average 4X more on the day that they are fueling up than any other day. So it is a really, really valuable audience for our brands um, with high attention that really delivers um, brand metrics. So um, again, been around for a while, but um, in our current iteration, um, really pretty new and really excited to bring content partners such as Super League with the Metaverse segment onto our platform to really to continue to um, deliver against that engagement that we, we hope to have. That's actually a couple of remarkable data points that I don't think I fully appreciated. I think Lane did, which is why he sought this partnership, which we'll, we'll ask him a little bit more about in a moment. but. Errand day. I mean, everybody in the country can relate to that. The idea that when you take the time to go fuel up your car, you're out, you're about, you're going to do other things. I had no idea that there would be such a significant um, amount of spend increase on those days. 4X. That's, mm -hmm. that's profound. So when you're sitting there in front of that screen and you're thinking of all the things on your list for errand day and something pops up on that screen that has any relevance whatsoever to where you're going or what you're thinking of purchasing, the impact has, has got to be pretty, uh, pretty meaningful. I mean, that seems like a natural place where brands want to put their messaging and get you excited about the products that, that you can buy from them. Uh, absolutely. And um, Forex is an average, so it's actually even higher. Um, for the number one and number two stops people make after fueling up, which are food related, 
Um, beyond the sea store, not even counting the sea store, where two thirds of the fuelers go into the sea store and buy something. But the other top two are QSR and grocery, which again makes sense. Aaron Day, you're running around, you need to get food to eat, you're running to the store to get groceries for your for your family. So CPG is a category that you know we crush it. We have so many great um, case studies. Um, but beyond that kind of immediate impulse purchase, which is um, we're a great trigger for, because of that high attention, we also can deliver um, upper funnel. Um, awareness and cons brand consideration metrics as well, because people li like the content, they're paying attention, we have full engagement, um, the brand recall is very, very high. So there's a long tail effect to that too. Okay, so you're getting into a lot of the things that we talk about um, related to how we reach consumers and the impact we're trying to have. So Lane, where was the intersection here? Like what was the inspiration for, for this partnership? Yeah, I think um, here's where I can kind of bring things back around to my professional network and things that we get excited about. Um, something called last click attribution. If you're talking about digital or just the last media channel to ha give that nudge to somebody right before they make a purchase. Um, and the, the um, it may not be the best modeling, um, but that does tend to drive how a lot of marketers spend their money. They want to make sure that I'm putting my money at the most efficient um, place in the market um, that's going to lead to the transaction that gets me a return on my ad spend. And the nice part is both GSTV and Super League play that role. It just depends on the screen that somebody's looking at and where they're sitting and what they're doing. And so when it's errand day, the driver is out of their car and they're not on their phone and they're a captive audience in front of the screens that GSTV has. And oh yeah, by the way, it might be time for a snack right inside that C-store. Meanwhile, the passenger is playing Roblox on their phone in the car. And yeah, hey, I want a snack too. Um, and who's gonna cue the behavior of buying Kraft Lunchables or a Kellogg's Pop-Tart or something else? It might be the passenger who's on you know, in game and it might be the, uh, the person at the pump. It doesn't matter, it's a synergistic effect. Um, and a lot of times you have a family co-viewing kind of uh, opportunity where uh, the kid might be on on the way home from uh, you know practice uh, in, in middle school and uh, the parent is is doing the driving and one of them cues the other of yeah it's time for a snack we got another 20 minutes on the road here let's go ahead and get something um, and so if we can bring those kind of solutions to the market together it makes for a, a really interesting um, combination. Um, and, uh, I think that that's the reason that I, I think retail media networks in general are becoming a, a hot item. Um, and a lot of the dollars in the programmatic or digital space are moving towards, um, things closer to checkout, whether it's at a convenience store or other kind of retail marketing networks that are out there. Just to underscore something there, cause that was, um, perfect. I should hire you, Lane. Sorry, Matt. Um, <laughs> But it's really a unique moment in time, right? Like consumers are bombarded by ads. I don't even know what that number is now, hundreds of thousands of ads, you know, it's crazy. But this is a unique moment in time where they don't have their phone. We have research that proves that, you know, we'll hear a client or an agency person say, oh, but I always get my phone out. Yeah, a few people do, but not really not that many people do. Let 4% is the actual number from our most recent um, uh, research and it makes sense because your car, your phone's in the car. It's charging. It might be your nav. It's it's just not. You need two hands to fuel up. So it just makes sense. So we have this un, un uh, distracted, attentive audience that's poised for action, and um, it's just it, it's a truly unique um, platform. And I know we're going to get to this, but like the idea of being able to connect digital and physical is what I think. Also, we were just both so interested in how do we. How do we nail that and kind of create that flywheel between between the two and drive sales for brands at the end of the day? I mean, I like that notion quite a bit. I mean, look, we're all consumed by our devices. And I, I think um, each of us would appreciate having more moments in the day where we are either um, too distracted with other activity so that we're not looking at a screen that's pouring information into our brains in one form or another, or where we can purposefully decide to do that, which not a lot of people have enough discipline to do. So the moment you step out of your car, 
Um, I know when I'm fueling up, it's sort of like, okay, I could take a breath for a moment. I'm actually fueling the car and I don't have to think about anything else. Well, there's the TV screen and whatever's on there just is entertaining. It's, it, it feels like a moment where I can, um, sort of zone out and, and watch something that is going to be entertaining in, in some form. And it's not actively chosen by me, which is, is, a, is a little bit of a, of a refresher. Um, the other thing that occurred to me, <clears throat> which is pretty, pretty powerful, I think, for brands to, to think about, when you're talking about that passenger, driver, parent, child, uh, friend-to-friend uh, relationship, a lot of times the passenger is on, on that device. And if it's somebody playing a game, somebody who's on Roblox and Lunchables and Super League as partners have been successful um, making Lunchables uh, a known brand inside Roblox for that passenger. And particularly in either direction, if somebody's hungry, of course the immediate brand on, on the mind of the passenger is going to be Lunchables. And that's going to have influence over what's purchased at the sea store uh, or even at the store um, where the family <clears throat> may go after fueling up. Um, and that's, that's rather profound. And I guess that, that kind of speaks to the real power of <clears throat> sorry, retail media networks. So let's just define a retail media network. Uh, it, it gets thrown around a ton, but it's a relatively... Mm -hmm new concept in terms of its size and scale compared to media channels that at least the average, I'll call it professional, is aware of. Um, so maybe, Christina, you can start us off. What, how do you help people understand what a retail media network is and, and why they've become so important? Well, um, we, maybe we can, talk, we can talk a little bit about the history of it as well. But I mean, just to go back to the definition of what is a retail media network, um, you know, it's frankly just where retailers offer, offer the opportunity for brands to buy ad placements against their audience. Um, the goal is, I think, in most cases to monetize their data, um, to connect with their shoppers, provide great connections there. Um, and do so for for brands as as well. Um, I, I just read this the other day um, that there it's estimated that forty percent of retailers have retail media networks today. I haven't I haven't had a chance to dig into what that means, but um, that's a shocking number when you think about it. And and why is that happening? Um, it's because what you're talking about. It's I think retail media you know, by its purest definition has really existed for quite some time. That that was probably with shopper money, trade money, it was between brands and manufacturers to get end caps, do in-store promotions, all those things that are still happening, but weren't driven by data. What's different now is this first party data that's driven by the digital ecosystem of all of these retailers. And that is from their loyalty pro programs, it's from their shopper data, they have a lot of sources for it now. So, um, you know, what we, you know, we talk about ourselves as a retail media network as well. In fact, I like to joke that we're we're kind of an accidental um, retail media network because we've been serving um, brand ads to um, consumers with um, within proximity to purchase for years and proving that it works. Um, but if we take a step back and think about Walmart and Amazon and some of the other big ones out there, really the three key tenants for success for a retail media network are scale. And we can come back to that because there's a lot of these out there right now and they don't have scale. Scale, um, engagement and proximity to purchase, like we were just talking about, and measurement. Um, usually closed looped measurements, sometimes not. So there are a lot of different ways to skin that cat, but those are really kind of the three things, it, how we define it as a, in the industry, I would say define it as um, a retail media network. Yeah, just to, to add to that, and this is kind of showing age and stuff, but um, in, a, in a previous life, I ran media for Gateway Computers back when Scott Galloway wanted to become an active member of the board. And, and uh, uh, our media um, plan called for uh, advertising in the Best Buy circular before we did anything else. Mm -hmm. And that was money and checks being written to Best Buy as a media channel. Now, at that time, it was a circular that was in the newspaper featuring all the things you could buy at Best Buy. Most of those are now an app on the phone. But uh, that was a very profitable uh, um, 
endeavor for Best Buy that was actually fueling the growth of Best Buy. So, so it was paying for itself off of the brands and the marketing funds of everybody that was on their shelves. It didn't have all the things that Christina was talking about, like first party data of who buys what and how often and when they're likely to be in the market. But now with the Amazons and the Walmarts and the uh, Target Roundels of the world, they do have that data and they don't have the cost of printing things like newspaper circulars that can't do bottom funnel kind of attribution. They can do it all. And so um, they they are seeing a huge resurgence. Um, and it's a, I think that's why it's an, it's an exciting place to be. And, and GSTV, uh, whether it was accidental or not, I think you're right there with Aaron Day and purchase behaviors and um, kind of a, almost an unwired network of retail locations that um, has a massive footprint. Uh, and we're, that's why, that's what we're so excited to be, to be partners. For, further to that point, um, in that same article I read about 40% um, of US retailers have a retail media network. I also read that there's an estimated over 200 retail media networks. I mean, I think if the three of us tried right now, we could name 10, right? And um, so it's mind boggling. So so that's why I was saying before, scale is such a critical part of this because I, you know, I think back to all the other kind of ups and downs we've gone through with media where the industry eventually moves towards some sort of consolidation in the ability to buy and execute because no brand or, or agency can execute against 200, you know, let's set Amazon and Walmart aside, but the other 198 um, to get the scale in whatever those areas, you know, you're interested in. So, you know, C-Store um, has retail, um, 7-Eleven is probably the best known with their Gulp network. Wawa announced one recently, they're only in three states, like, so that's an example. Um, and Chase, Chase um, just announced a retail media network last week as a Chase customer. I'm not honestly sure how I feel about my financial data being a part of some sort of retail media network. I don't, I can't wrap my head around how this is going to work yet, but very interesting. So there's something for everybody um, in terms of retail media. But Lane, something you just said is it's about the ability to scale that. And um, C-Store is very fragmented. Um, even with 7-Eleven, Circle K, some of the very big ones who we also work with, those are a small percentage of the total C-Store network. 65% of C-Stores are owned by um, uh, their mom and pops. You know, they own like one to five stores. So imagine trying to scale a solution across that. Well, that's, you know, that's where, where GSTV comes in. So. That's why I call us an accident. We're we're acting on it, but you know we've been doing it a long time. So to your earlier question, Matt, it's like retail media. You know, different ways you define it has been around a, a long time. It's just getting smarter about how you use data um, to direct it and measure it. With GSTV, the advertising that occurs and appears inside this retail media network is being shown in a physical location. Uh -huh. um, when we Look at Amazon having a retail media network. I would imagine the overwhelming majority of those advertisements are on a device that you're using personally in a home or, or office environment. With physical retailers uh, like Walmart, I'm sure that's a balance where there's media inside the store, but I would imagine the overwhelming majority is still you know, through their digital footprint. And if, is, is that correct? Let me start there. Yes, absolutely. I actually did work with Walmart Connect in um, previous roles. Um, you know, I think they started in 2017 or 2018, 2019, um, a handful of years ago. And it was driven by um, their loyalty program that they built, which was super smart, right? So as they started to get data on their shoppers, um, they were using that to build this, this retail media net network from the ground up. Um, I don't remember their um, digital numbers off the top of my head, but I think in in store it's 200 million um, customers a month, a week. Um, now I'm not. Now I'm not. Don't quote me on that, but uh, it's a lot. It's the biggest. It's still large. So it's very, very large. Um, but that said, the majority, as far as I understand it, the majority of the revenue that comes in through Connect is is digital. Um, that's it's display ads, it's video ads on walmart.com. Um, they have extended that to um, 
in store with their TV wall, with receipts, um, a lot of other, you know, kind of um, uh, agile sources that they've got within the store. Um, and I think that will con continue to grow. I think what we're, we will also see from Walmart, or we are, we are seeing from Walmart, as well as other retail media network players, is extension to off-network um, and reaching using that data for their customers and reaching them um, in other places, such as a fuel and convenience store that might then drive that customer, you know, maybe it's within a radius, drive that customer um, to that store. So I think um, in my mind, um, selfishly, I hope, but I do believe it to be true. That is um, the kind of the next level of what's going to happen um, with re retail media as they can, you know, to continue to scale what they've got. They've got to reach their consumers in other places and, and drive them back to, you know, their own um, assets. So I uh, was just speaking with a company earlier uh, today, in fact, that is building a sort of... Um, next generation affiliate marketing solution. And they're working with content publishers, web publishers, digital publishers, and sort of leveling up the way that they can leverage the data available to those publishers, both through the content and um, user base that those publishers have, and do a better job of surfacing uh, products that the visitors to those digital publishers, websites, and apps might want to purchase. The interesting uh, notion that just occurred to me is that essentially can become a content publisher retail media network, at least in the way it's branded and brought to market, um, compared to what it's been called for a decade or more, which is just affiliate marketing. It, it sort of takes it up and it, it, this, the whole category, the notion, the idea of using retail, I'm sorry, using media space to dot, drive retail purchases, whether they're digital or physical, um, seems like it's just occupying a much larger percentage of, um, of mind share on the uh, part of CMOs and, and advertisers. Lane, I wonder if that is something that you're noticing um, in just the conversations that we as Super League are having, you know, with um, agencies and and brands. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, again, it comes back to you know somebody somewhere is going to be asked to justify why they spent that dollar, and uh, if you're close to where that purchase is happening, just by the fact that you're nearby, uh, your plan is going to look that much more efficient. So there's a, always a limit on how much you can spend at the very top of the funnel. And then the art is, well, what's the right shape of the funnel and how much is there? But the bottom never goes away. It's, it's, it's like paid search. Um, in some ways, this is replacing, I would even say maybe borrowing from budgets that were set aside for paid search because that was the most efficient thing you could get. Well, now we're even closer to the purchase because it's standing there in the checkout aisle. Um, and so that bottom level is never going to go away. Um, I think the unique... Uh, and, and not to queue up the next, you know, maybe topic we're going to cover, but bringing physical and digital kinds of items together um, in that transaction um, makes for a really unique solution um, that I think, uh, Matt, you've been leading the charge with uh, with our reward center. Um, and I think that people have even talked about the promise of NFTs. And when you have this digital token, it means something in the real world. And we haven't really seen that totally uh, come to manifestation at scale yet. It, it, there's been the the super early adopters that are trading NFTs and are, are, are super boutique -y about it. But if you had a item that you could unlock in a game after you spent an hour playing uh, Hershey's Obstacle Course, for example, um, and there were only so many digital trophies that were given away, there is a way to tie that to a promotional code or a redemption or something else that is very uh, valuable when it comes to satisfying that hunger in the real world. Um, and so why not reward time spent with brand that might happen in game with the actual item that happens in the real world? And that's where I think we can really make magic together between GSTV and Super League because we kind of own and understand that immersive media experience where we can put all those obstacle courses and goals and quests together that people are 
looking to achieve just from a social status standpoint. Like, how do you unlock that? That's really cool. Um, and yeah. And by the way, it gets you something over here that you know you want. Um, so I think that uh, I think that makes for a, a, a really compelling solution. And uh, if I know my kids well, they're going to be <laughs> earning as many in-game tokens so they don't have to ask me to uh, recharge their, you know, Roblox card or something because they can go earn some of these things instead of uh, asking for uh, cash. And you know what's unique? Like, I know we were thinking about this when we put this partnership together, but it just struck me listening to you is, um, especially in connection to retail media and search and, and the bottom of the funnel, right? The, the bottom of the funnel will always be there. What we're able to do with this partnership is full funnel, or if we use the new vernacular of collapse the funnel, whichever way you want to think about it, like where, you know, you can be driving brand awareness um, or product awareness or whatever awareness um, in game, bringing that through to our screens where you're not only continuing to drive awareness of that, but driving awareness that this brand is doing cool stuff in game and then at the same time drive to purchase. So like that's literally filling every level of the funnel, which is is a, an interesting proposition and I would argue makes us totally unique um, to other retail media offerings out there right now. Where do we collectively, I say we because part of the team here, but where do we see the challenge, right, with an advertiser? So um, especially when advertising dollars are in the hands of an agency and the agency has a specific set of goals, um, they need to achieve certain objectives, there are some tried and true uh, methods for doing so, although they're always attempting to bring something slightly innovative back to their client to demonstrate why their knowledge as an agency is superior to any of the other agencies the client might choose to work with in the future. What, what's the, what's going to be the challenge in getting them to look at what you just described, the collapsed funnel solution that we can offer? Is it just because they've never tried it before? Is it going to be because um, when they think about um, reaching customers in game, it's just a different construct and framework than what they think about in terms of reaching customers through a retail media network, where will there be friction? Christina, you wanna yeah. go first? Yeah, I can go first. We probably have similar perspectives, but um, I think candidly, one of our challenges will be how things are bought. And it's sad, it's sad, but it's true because <laughs> we, there are these archaic definitions of, you know, TV has become video and radio has become audio, but there's still these channels that um, are very well defined and have been for years and years and solutions like ours um, either live in none of them or all of them, depending on how you're defining it. So um, I think it's important to have conversations with people at the client and at the agency who can take that step back and have the full view of what the client or brand is trying to accomplish, what the KPIs are. Um, and then I think, you know, any of us in the room in that conversation can go, oh, OK, this is what you're trying to do. Oh, this is what we would execute over here for you that is going to deliver against that KPI. So I think the you know, said more simply, the challenge is finding the right, per right people um, to have the conversation with um, just so that we don't get caught in a swirl of, you know, who does what. Um, and that I'm saying this as someone who worked on the agency side for 25 years. Um, it, it, it can be difficult to navigate. Yeah, just to, to add on to that, uh, I mean, to the brand's credit, the P&Gs of the world and others that are out there, they're looking to make sure that people are staying in their lane, staying focused and chasing a KPI that they're experts in. Um, and for the most part, that works. Um, and so you're going to have specialists in social and you're going to have specialists in programmatic and event marketing and because the event marketing person's not going to do paid search. That doesn't make sense, right? And so there are these very defined lanes and um, kind of remits of you stay in this lane and do the best job you can. But every 10 years, there's like a, a watershed moment in the industry, like social was a little more than 10 years ago, where it confuses everybody because what is social? We don't have a lane for it. Um, at that time, it was this new digital thing. So is the head of digital own it? Mm, it ran video. Does the head of video own it? And it becomes this football of, well, who's going to claim ownership of it at the agency side? And a lot of times it takes the client to be the tiebreaker to say, guys, pause, time out. 
this is a new mix. This is a new uh, a new opportunity to collaborate, and I need you all to collaborate and work together. Everyone's going to contribute to this, but we have to keep our eye on the end goal, which is what's the most efficient return on ad spend? What reaches our newest audience with the highest lifetime value the most efficiently? Um, and so we're seeing that happen. The, the next generation spends more time in these kind of in-game immersive media products than they do on TikTok. And you believe some something trumps TikTok. Yes, games trump TikTok big time. And so w the the those lanes are being defined. Um, I think that you see CMOs that are driving innovation. Um, they're the first ones to adopt these things. They're the there is a R and D period you go through to figure out what is the right mix. Um, how heavy do we go on? Um, custom production versus integrations and other things. Um, so we're, I think we're in that experimental phase right now. Um, but there will be the head of immersive media popping out in um, the different holding companies and agencies and probably at the client themselves because the metrics are different. Um, you can't spend as much time with a brand in a banner ad. You can't go back and forth and earn a token that is worth something in the real world watching a video on YouTube. But you can inside games, and uh, it's still relatively low competition, which means the pricing is still relatively low compared to where it's going to be two or three years from now. Um, as more and more brands come in, we know what happens to the prices. And so like right now, it's kind of the Goldilocks, I think, period for those brands to try these innovative collapsed funnel or full funnel kind of solutions. And um, you know, Christina and Super League, we're, we're here to do it for them. I love that. Where does Gen Z fit um, for the GSTV um, audience and and focus? Is it a meaningful part of the audience? Is it some? Uh, is it a demographic that that advertisers uh, are looking to reach and believe GSTV can help them reach? Well, uh, yes, 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 and yes. Um, our audience is. Um, I mean, it's the full gamut. It, it really, truly is. Um, speaking of research, we just announced this, I guess a week, week and a half ago, um, a study with Samba um, to measure, um, really the purpose of it was incrementality to television. Um, and we had some dated research we wanted to update and it was phenomenal, not only in terms of total incrementality that GSTV can provide to television, um, but unsurprisingly, that incrementality is coming from younger viewers. Um, younger viewers or light TV viewers, they're very difficult to get in 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 uh, linear television in particular. Um, and so it was just kind of one of those things that came out of the research that intuitively knew we knew was right that we we got some great great numbers against. So um, I think it's you know the benefit of GSTV is it's 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 all audiences. You know, Lane was talking before about multiple people in the car, and um, we have very family friendly programming because we're sensitive to that, not only to the audience in the car, but also our retailers. Um, and having something that is, you know, fun and engaging and entertaining to any age and um, in, in any any person. So um, it's a strong suit for us. And so um, Super League for us, our partnership checks a few boxes. One is um, a partnership that aligns against that younger end of the audience, which helps balance out some that we've got on the other end of the spectrum. Um, but also importantly, just the the genre of of gaming. Um, so we think about what do our viewers want, but we also think about where what our brands were, want. And there's those you know concentric circles where where all of them meet, and you've got that sweet spot is where the magic happens, right? And we just started seeing more and more um, gaming references and RFPs that were coming through to GSTV. And right when I started about a year ago, we we started talking about like we need a partner in the in the gaming space. We didn't know what that looked like. We didn't know what it meant. And um, Lane called at the perfect time. And we started talking about how to bring this together. So um, it, for us, it just really, it checks a lot of boxes. But back to your question about younger audience, we're thrilled about having this content that we know is really super serving um, the younger part of our demographics. Um, and that's great for brands too, because they're so hard to reach. Lane, where do you think the, the um, power moment is in connecting with um, the consumer audience around uh, around the value that that 
you know, we can explain to a brand is the power moment. And, and maybe you're going to say it's a combination. It brings us back to what you were referencing earlier in the, the physical to digital link um, and kind of the bridge that, that creates that sort of, I'll call it an omnichannel, um, uh, you know, solution. But is the power moment um, compelling a, mem a member of the Gen Z audience in game to realize, okay, I've now got um, a badge, a token, something that I can redeem off of Roblox, and, as an example, and it's worth something to me in the real world. By the way, that happens to be at a convenience store at a GSTV location, and so I'm seeking the redemption connected to you know the fuel up moment. You know when I'm either old enough and driving my own car or I'm with mom or dad and, you know, they're the ones um, bringing me along for errand day. Um, or is the power moment when they're at a GSTV location and they're watching gaming content and that gaming content is supported, promoted, sponsored by a brand uh, they're interested in who we have helped create um, a presence for inside an immersive platform. Do you think it's it's one is going to outweigh the other? Do they do they complement each other just beautifully? Like, where's that signature solution or not not solution? Where, what's that signature hook, right? That we can present to an agency or a brand and say, look, if this happens, this is the result. Yeah, I I think uh, I think you set it up great, Matt. I think that it is a flywheel effect where they re the the two experiences reinforce each other. Um, especially in the short term, which is really how most of the budgets get planned. Nobody's really planning 20 years from now. They're worried about the quarter and, 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 and making sure Wall Street's happy. That said, the smarter brands that do invest in longer term relationships and realize that, you know, uh, the, 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 the earlier brand affinities develop, the higher the lifetime value on um, and the one thing that uh, an immersive media environment provides, whether and it doesn't have to be in a game, it could be with an AR headset, it could be whatever, but time spent with brand is, I think, the new space we're moving into, um, where where there's there's a bit of an infinite place to spend your, how to choose to spend your time. Um, people aren't watching broadcast linear. People are choosing what to consume when and how long they uh, are, are, are spending there. And so the brands that are putting some constructs together that draw people voluntarily to an experience they want to have. Um, that to me is a, an impression that is deeper and longer lasting and leads to multiple purchases downstream. The first one might come just because, hey, we reminded you at the right moment. But then once I've done it two or three times, I'm, I'm now a lifelong customer. Um, and so that I think is something that immersive media has in spades uh, over the interruptive ad model of how do we insert an ad in in front of people just for a second, um, and and we're bringing the best of both of those things together, uh, both for the short term and, and long term. I, I think I think it's a it's a, a perfect complement. I'm I'm thinking about um, who we compete with as a unified, you know, front. Um, and, and when I look out at, at the landscape, they're really, other than like a single retailer, a single brand, choosing to do something in an immersive space and to tie that immersive presence back to something that is retail oriented. Um, I don't know that there's an example of, of a solution that can accomplish what what we're offering here, and and I wonder, Christina, when you're thinking about the way to distinguish uh, GSTV, um, is that one of the opportunities that 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 you are sort of excited about at this point, both connected to our partnership, but also the way that you think about you know GSTV's market position in general? Yes. Um I'm really focused, um, and, and frankly, when I have a hallway conversation, I was just at a uh, conference last week, um, 
just to give a snippet on what we're doing um, with Super League, I say we're bringing in-game and in real life, sending back into in-game, sending into store. It's a flywheel that we're creating between um, digital and physical. What brand wouldn't want be wouldn't want to be a part of that? And that always uh, gets some eyes opened. Um, and that's like my most simple way to describe it. Um, it perfectly aligns with what we're doing with a couple of other partners too. Very different from um, from your company, but we're partnered with Influential um, in terms of working with influencers. That's fairly new, as well as um, TikTok. And again, all of these things are about taking what we know consumers are engaging uh, to Lane's earlier uh, point about all the time spent with gaming. They're engaging with all of these platforms for hours and hours and hours a day. They're engaging, they're entertaining. And the ability to take what you're doing in that space as a brand and bring it into real life where you can send someone to purchase or add to awareness as to Lane's earlier point and continue to build that brand love. Um, I think it's unique. Um, you know, is there something else out there off the top of my head? I don't think so. Um, so we got to jump on that. <laughs> Get it in front of as many people as possible. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that, of that speed, of that speed. It's very, uh, it's attractive and important. Um, content is a big part of what drives the engagement for GSTV and um, gaming content has, as, as you pointed out, sort of become more important because you were seeing RFPs that were asking more about gaming and gamers, uh, presumably, you know, because of the reach to younger audiences. Uh, Lane, I know that content has always been at the center of, of your thinking in terms of this partnership, but just overall, um, can you talk a little bit and just share how we're using content to drive uh, the promise of this partnership? Yeah, um, you know, content within the world of gaming has uh, all the different um, spectrums that you would expect of other media channels. Not everybody plays the same game, um, rarely. Now, there are a couple mega hits out there, and all credit to the Minecraft and the Fortnites of the world, where they've got, it is one game and they have a global audience. Um, Roblox, which is also uh, a strength of ours, or things like uh, mobile gaming, casual gaming on, on, on phones that maybe m moms are playing. Everybody's got their own, uh, I guess, uh, zone where they're going to invest that voluntary time. Um, the nice part I think about Super League is we can cater those activations and integrations to where the intended audience is likely to be spending their time. We are not solely dependent on one game where there's the giant bottleneck and everybody's competing to get in there. And we know what that does to prices and everything else. Uh, it, it just makes for a much heavier lift. Um, we're more of the, I think, SDK approach. Let content be the king and attract the audiences that are natural to them. And then how do we make it a very low lift to make sure that a brand is showing up, adding to that uh, experience and participation in a meaningful way where they're, they're looked at as, wow, this is really cool that the brand is here and supporting my favorite game, not, not perceived to be an interruption in any way, um, and even rewarding people for uh, their time and energy. Be at the right place across yeah. uh, the right uh, natural um, sources of content for the right audience um, and, and bring something additive to that experience. And Christina, obviously content is at the heart of, of your business. Do you look at content on GSTV in sort of verticals of interest? Do you think about, we have people you know who are fueling up who are sports fans and there are people who are thinking about designing their home and we have people who play games. Is that sort of the, the again, I guess framework um, that goes into the content selection and, and I guess also becomes valuable to different verticals of advertisers? Yeah, absolutely. We, um, we don't limit to categories because I think the, the um, most important thing is, will it be, well, two most important things. Um, will it be entertaining to our viewers, our consumers? And is it um, sellable <laughs> to brands? Will brands want to be associated with this? Because in an ideal world, we're providing those content opportunities, which is exactly what we're talking about with Metaverse, is for 
brands um, to be associated with it. Um, it might just be as simple as having their ad next to the content segment um, from Super League. It might be doing an integrated, um, having their brand integrated into the segment with news reporting on what they're doing in game. Or it might be something fully custom, completely aligned with their KPIs, but it um, it's content in the, it truly is content in the eyes of a viewer. Um, and they're watching it, learning something, and they're they're entertained. So, I think that um, the verticals are are important so that we can kind of segment a little bit. We obviously don't want our entire network to be five gaming partners. We want to have different types of content: music, sports, um, uh, food, travel, gaming. These are all things that um, our viewers have said they they like, and our brands have said they're interested in being associated with us. So, for us, bringing those two things together allows us to be a great entertainment platform, but also at the end of the day, we're a media publisher with you know advertising opportunities for brands um, to drive their sales. So we've talked about quite a bit and the idea of one episode of our podcast helping people understand what a company they may not have heard of in GSTV, but have likely encountered um, is you know one pretty terrific uh, topic. We've discussed retail media networks. We've gotten into immersive media, the connection of digital to physical, uh, the importance of first party data. I mean, we've really, you know, wrapped a lot into the conversation. And so with this final question, um, I, I think, you know, I'm curious how you'll how you'll answer it. And that is, all of this is in front of brands today. Uh, CMOs, as you pointed out, Lane, are thinking about how um, these new spaces, immersive media, and to some extent, retail media networks, um, sort of encroaching on uh, prior protected territory and lanes that they used to, not lane, you lane, but the lanes that they used to sort of um, have uh, for a decade that are well established in terms of how they think of spending their money. Um, so more choices, um, more challenges. Uh, so when you think about, you know, one or two uh, pieces of advice, takeaways from this conversation uh, that a a marketer, um, either at the CMO level or an agency who's trying to really um, reinforce their value and their forward thinking strategy to help one of their clients. What are one or two takeaways that you would share with those people? We'll start with uh, with Lane. Yeah, uh, real simple. Uh, if you're looking for a way to connect. Uh, with your audience, um, great way to do that is give them an opportunity to earn a branded power up in game, and then make sure they are getting the physical version of that power up in the form of, uh, you know, some orange juice or Kellogg's pop tarts or something else. Uh, when they're reminded about the fact that they can go redeem things right now in the convenience store, um, so connect those two worlds: power up in game when you're powering up the car. Sounds like a slogan. That, that, that's like a marketing yeah, tagline like in addition to a me. piece of advice. Um, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, and the way I'm, I'm thinking about that, if I were speaking to a CMO, is follow your consumer. Um, your consumer lives in these different worlds and they are nimble. So be nimble with your consumer. Follow your consumer to the different places that they're going. Connect those worlds. Um, and, and we're one of, if not the only one of the few places that you can actually um, do that. And, and then, you know, just a little poke to, you know, test and learn, be, um, take calculated risks. Uh, I think each of our companies have a million case studies that we could show individually for, for brands and for, for categories. Um, the power of what we can bring together is, is really, um, exciting and to be determined. And if I were a CMO, I'd want to be the first one to do it. So that would be my message. Very good. Well, I thank you both for joining today's episode. It's been a very energizing and informative conversation. I have no doubt we will um, get a lot of uh, satisfied listeners um, telling us uh, that very fact. So again, really appreciate you being here and um, excited for sure about coming back six months, nine months, 12 months from now and uh, being able to talk about all the things that we've accomplished together. Let's do it. This has been great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Matt. 
Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of Beam. You can listen to the full episode of our extended conversation on your favorite podcast platform with much more detail that I'm sure you're going to find exciting and informative. Thank you very much for listening. Please subscribe for updates and so you can catch our next episode.